Our next speaker is Dr. Gary Montero. Um, he's Assistant Professor of Clinical Anesthesiology here at Houston Methodist, and he's going to be talking about non-cardiac surgery and endocarditis prophylaxis. So we're going to switch gears here, and I'm going to talk about non-cardiac surgery, endocarditis prophylaxis. Um, just uh, when we talk about endocarditis, what we're typically talking about is an infection, um, and this is a uh, mitral valve vegetation or endocarditis of the mitral valve here. Um, and I don't have any disclosures that have anything to do with this lecture. So we're going to talk about some guidelines for antibiotic prophylaxis and non-cardiac surgery, um, specifically in the adult congenital population. If you're going into the uh, OR, the hospital, or the outpatient center for an elective surgery, depending on what that surgery is, most, most of you will get prophylactic antibiotics for that surgery. If it's a knee scope, um, the real question is, is um, what's changed when you go into the dentist? Um, there are a lot of procedures where antibiotic prophylaxis isn't given. It may be something like um, an upper GI, you know, um, or a lower uh, colonoscopy. Um, typically, no antibiotics are given for that. But for your normal operating room procedures and for specific cath lab procedures with your cardiologist, um, prophylactic antibiotics uh, will be given routinely. So there are a couple guidelines. And again, I just included um, another picture of some endocarditis where she should see this valve surface being nice and smooth and beautiful. It's rough, and I guess you could say that's still beautiful, but um, it shouldn't look like that. So when we talk about endocarditis, typically there's a series of events that leads up to one of the valves in your heart getting infected. Typically, we're looking for blood flow to be straight lines or laminar flow, and at some point, there's some inciting event that will cause the flow to be turbulent and cause eddies and areas of low flow. Um, different pressure gradients with swirling blood. And so um, that's typically caused to turbulent flow. This could be an injury to the vessel. It could just be plaque as you get older. Um, it could be calcium deposits. After there's this turbulent flow, something occurs where uh, bacteria get loose in your bloodstream. This could be something as simple as brushing your teeth. This could be a surgical procedure where you get your uh, surgical incision. It could be a cut on your skin. It could be... Uh, upper respiratory infection. Once that happens and the bacteria is in your bloodstream, the next thing that has to happen is that bacteria has to find these rough spots and stick to them or adhere to them. And then even after that, these bacteria have to grow and cause a uh, vegetation. So here's a picture of uh, some teeth that need to be extracted as a, uh, you can see inflammation surrounding them. Um, but some of the most common bacteria that we're talking about here are um, strep viridans, which is just a normal bacteria that lives in your mouth. And we're specifically referring to endocarditis here that doesn't um, occur from IV drug use. Um, I did some of my training in Seattle, and we saw a lot, a lot of IV drug use and endocarditis as a result of it. Um, but today we're talking mainly about non-IV drug use uh, endocarditis. And like I said, strep viridans is part of just the normal bacteria that live in your mouth. Um, and tooth extraction. So if you go to the dentist and you have an infected tooth that's got some plaque and uh, gingivitis around it, the, uh, you're about a 10, depending on which study you look at, 10 to 100% of the time you're going to have a transient bacterial release in your bloodstream. When you brush your teeth at home twice a day, because we all do brush our teeth twice a day and floss, the uh, transient bacteremia is going to be about 20 to 68% of the time, depending on which study. But when you look at this, the exposure to having just a transient burst of bacteria in your bloodstream over one year is about five and a half million times higher just for brushing your teeth than from having a single tooth extraction. So what does that tell us? It tells us that you're more likely to have this risk of uh, transient bacteremia or transient bacteria in your blood just from your normal daily activities. So why don't we all have endocarditis? It's because it's a process and that's only one inciting event. So through, throughout the years, I say this like I'm really old, um, there have been different recommendations on what to do for specifically dental procedures. And you can see all the way back to uh, 1955, um, penicillin shots, all the way down to um, penicillin, prophylaxis for days before your dental procedure, to uh, amoxicillin, you know, to PO antibiotics that you, you, everyone's familiar with. So there were some updates in 2007 and they said sort of what I was inferring, that endocarditis is more likely to result from the random things you do every day, 
Oh, I hope brushing your teeth is not random. But random bacteremia is associated with brushing your teeth. Then it is from you know, getting, a den getting your teeth cleaned at the dentist, um, having a cystoscopy or an upper GI procedure. And prophylaxis, therefore, would only prevent a very, very small number of endocarditis, if anything, when you're having one of these, uh, your teeth cleaning or one of these outpatient procedures. So much so that the risk of everyone getting antibiotics for these procedures outweighs the, um, the benefit of prevention, except in high-risk populations, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So here we go. What are high-risk populations? So specifically, if you've had a cardiac valve replacement where you have a prosthetic material, if you've had endocarditis before and you've been treated for it, you're high risk for endocarditis, of course. And then this is what we're here to talk about. It's the congenital heart disease. Uh, there's four of them, uh, not counting heart transplantation um, with uh, recurrent valvulopathy. But in congenital heart disease, there's four specific situations where it's still recommended to have um, antibiotic prophylaxis before these low-risk low procedures. Um, if you remain cyanotic, if you have unrepaired cyanotic disease with uh, shunts and conduits, if you've had a heart surgery where they replaced whatever your defect was with a prosthetic material, and it's been in a short period of time since that, and they say six months, and the reason they say six months is because there's a period of time after you get foreign material before your body covers it with its own tissue. Um, Repaired congenital heart disease um, with a residual defect that's um, creating turbulent flow near a prosthetic patch or a prosthetic device. And uh, those are the three. And then the fourth is cardiac transplantation with recurrent valvulopathy in congenital heart patient or any patient with a heart transplant. Um, same concept but different paper, um, just stating the specific uh, congenital heart issues and, you know, the the, um, congenital, the three congenital heart and then heart transplant. Recommendations for infective endocarditis is that congenital heart disease patients that have these conditions are, have a potential risk for infective endocarditis to discuss with your congenital heart disease uh, physician. Um, and patients that have, if you have signs and symptoms of endocarditis, and what that means is you have malaise, fever, symptoms of infection that you need to go see your uh, adult congenital cardiologist, your primary care physician, um, and always be thinking of endocarditis. I, I, I just always keep it in the back of my mind whenever I go to the dentist. So, but I don't take antibiotics before I go to the dentist. So the current recommendations, um, if you meet any of those criteria and you need an, uh, antibiotics, are most of us can swallow pills, and it's just typically amoxicillin. Um, if you're unable to take um, pills, uh, there's ampicillin or typically one of the um, um, ceftriaxone or ANCEF. Um, there's recommendations for Clinda if you're allergic to penicillins. So these are just you know, very limited antibiotics for prophylaxis for dental procedures. Non-dental procedures, typically we don't give antibiotics for uh, upper GI um, sort of stuff unless you have an infection. Um, and then the other indication is that if you have unrepaired uh, congenital heart disease, uh, cyanotic heart disease, and you're having a vaginal delivery in conjunction with your high-risk OB, it may be indicated to have um, antibiotics for that procedure. So in summary, um, bacteremia results from things you do in your daily life. The concept of a tooth extraction is uh, causing that. It definitely causes bacteremia, but causing endocarditis is exceedingly rare. Um, so only very few cases would be prevented by giving everybody antibiotics. However, if you meet any of those you know, three, four conditions that would be indicated for antibiotics for your dental procedure, then you should have them before your dental procedure. Thank you.